Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tanya Burkhart. I'm an Associate Director in the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion here at LSE and also an Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy. And I'm delighted to welcome so many of you uh, to what is the UK launch of Ingrid Robain's book, Limitarianism, The Case Against Extreme Wealth. And tonight's event is co-hosted by CASE, the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion, the Department of Government, and a new initiative at LSE called the Cohesive Capitalism Programme, uh, about which we may hear more later. Uh, so, welcome to Ingrid, uh, in the middle of our panel here. Welcome also to our panellists, Martin Sanbu from the Financial Times, and Leia Upi from here uh, at LSE. I'll introduce each of them a little bit more when we get started. Ingrid will be introducing some of the key themes from her book for around 30 minutes or so, and then we'll hear responses from Martin and from Leia before opening to you for uh, questions and discussion with the panel. Uh, for Twitter users, the hashtag for today is hashtag LSE Wealth, so please feel free to tweet. Uh, the event is being recorded and all being well, a podcast will be made available in due course. Uh, but now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ingrid Robains. She holds the Chair in Ethics of Institutions at Utrecht University and her work focuses on socioeconomic questions in contemporary political philosophy and applied ethics. Her academic journey has taken her through economics and philosophy, including via a PhD at Cambridge University supervised by Amartya Sen. She was the first academic director of the Dutch Research School of Philosophy, and she served as president of the Human Development and Capability Association from 2018 to 2020. She's a life member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and was awarded an Emma Goldman Award for her work on inequality by the Flax Foundation. She contributes uh, not only to scholarly debate, but also to wider public debate in Dutch and in English, uh, and publishes in newspapers, blogs, and other widely accessed formats, uh, as well as scholarly articles and books. She recently concluded the Fair Limits Project, supported through a European Research Council grant, and it was through this project that Ingrid's thinking on libertarianism developed, uh, which is the subject of today's event. Ingrid. Thank you all for coming and to discuss uh, together uh, questions about inequality and extreme wealth. Um, First, I want to find out how all of you would answer the question, how much is enough for me? So how much, and then I mean how much money? How much money would be enough for you? And when I ask that question, I basically want to ask how much wealth, so not income, but wealth, would you need to be able to have the kind of job that you would really like to do, even if it's not the best paid job? <laughs> but also uh, taking into account that you may, for example, have uh, parents that you need to support or small children or a disabled family member. So let's find out. Can I ask you to stand up and then I will say numbers. And when you hear the number that's enough for you, you can sit down. <laughs> So for whom, <laughs> yeah, you're not debating the number, but you're not going to hear me if you're going to discuss it. You can discuss the, the details about how you came to your number uh, later on at the, at the drinks. Who would feel that, or who would come to the idea that 250,000 uh, pounds is enough? Who would go for, who would say 500,000 pounds is enough? One million pounds is enough. 
two million pounds is enough. <laughs> Five million pounds is enough. <laughs> Ten million pounds is enough. Uh, Fifty million pounds is enough. Okay, so we had a few who want. Nobody thinks. So note, nobody thinks the sky is the limit. At least when, in answer to this question, let me tell you a bit more about uh, where I would draw the line. So what I want to um, defend today, briefly, because I mean the book is like uh, 380 pages and I only have 25 minutes left. What I want to defend today is the idea of limitarianism, which is the idea that there should be an upper limit to wealth. And it is, uh, this is a moral and a political view. So I'm standing here primarily as a normative political philosopher, so a moral philosopher working on political questions. And it is a view that says that there should be an upper limit to how much wealth we can hold. And I will first, I will already tell you now what the limits are that I propose. Then I will give you my arguments and then I will explain how I come to those numbers. I propose two limits. One is a political limit of 10 million euros, pounds, dollars. I know about the concept of exchange rates, so don't worry. But it is a ballpark figure. I really, I mean, I, if you were to change this in 12 million, fine, or whatever. Um, and the political limit means how we should organize society. And then there is a second limit, which I call an ethical or a, a voluntaristic limit, which I would pu put for a country such as mine at around 1 million, and that actually is based on some research we did, and perhaps I will have time to tell you about this. But what is the issue? What is the issue we're facing? The issue we're facing is wealth concentration. I will not talk about numbers, because there are other people who can do this much better than I have, can do and who have done this, but I think we can say that income and wealth inequalities are, first of all, significant. I would say they are large, very large. They are also larger than most people believe they are. We know that from empirical research. And they have, in most places, been increasing since the 1980s. This is the work from Thomas Piketty and all the people who, worked in, uh, who work as welfare economists. Um, let me give you, just to give you some numbers, data from the 2023, that's the latest Global Wealth Report. This is the Global Wealth Pyramid. So this is how the distribution of wealth in the world looks like. And I want to point out two things in particular. At the very top, we see uh, 95 million people, or 1.1%, one, who have more than $1 million. But then, if you see what a small, small group this is in uh, the entire um, wealth distribution. At the bottom we see that 52.5% of uh, the global uh, population has less than $10,000 and actually many people have like virtually no wealth or have actually a negative wealth. And this uh, top group of um, people who hold more than $1 million is also deceiving to say, okay, there are 95 million people who have more than $1 million, because within that group, there's also a huge difference with, uh, at the very top, uh, as you know, there are about 3,000 billionaires um, who have um, yeah, at least $1 uh, billion, but I, I didn't check what the latest state is today, because you can go to the Forbes list and every day they update the estimates of what the billionaires have and I think it's around 250 mil uh, dollars uh, that uh, Elon Musk has. He, I think he's again on top. He and Bernard Arnault constantly switch depending on um, how their stocks are doing. Let's look at the UK. At the left you see the part, the, you see shares of the population the bottom 40% of the people living in the UK have 4.4% of wealth. If, they, if there would be an exact equal distribution of wealth, they should have 40%. But 40% of people hold 4.4% of wealth. The next 50%, so the people, you could say, like in the, uh, the middle, but a bit at the, already in the middle and the upper middle class, they hold 45.6%, so that's like roughly an equal share. 
And then we see 10% of the people living in the UK who hold 52% of all wealth, of which, if you then uh, look into more detail, the top 5% on its own has 40% and the top 1% has 22.6%. And there are estimates that, the, the, that if you look at the trends over the last year, that this concentration of wealth will increase. So this is my starting point. This is where I start with my analysis. And then I think if we see this, we can ask a couple of questions, different types of questions. One question we can ask is, how big are these inequalities and how are they changing? These are questions about measurement, which I won't touch. This is what welfare economists uh, do. Then we can ask questions, what explains this both large inequality or this rising inequality? I, I, um, in the book, I, exp I give explanations that have been provided in the literature, but I will today also, um, at least not in the presentation, touch upon this, but we can come back to this in the, um, the Q&A. Although perhaps in one sentence I can say that it's really a shift in the kind of capitalism that we've had since the 1980s, which in the literature is often called uh, a shift towards neoliberal capitalism, often associated with a change in political regime with Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the US that has come with a, a, a set of policy choices and political decisions that have uh, led to more um, economic organization via the market and has also led to rising inequalities. My focus will be on the third type of questions, namely, what are the reasons to worry about this? Or, if you want to phrase it in another way, is, this, is there a moral issue with this? I say, if any, because it could be that actually, I mean, you know, I, I've written a book about arguing against wealth concentration, so it's not what I can say, but it could in principle be that as a moral philosopher, you ask, what is wrong with X? And that the answer is, there's nothing wrong with X. But I do think there are really important reasons to worry about wealth concentration. And then the last question is, what can then be done? What are the policies or the actions? The big bulk of my book is on three. It's on the reasons why I think we should worry about um, wealth concentration. And um, hence, I also see this book as a contribution to a larger literature where others, other scholars or other writers have actually contributed more to these other questions. So that's what I'll do. And my argument will be that if you look at those reasons, and I'll look at a number of them, taken together, these reasons justify a limit to how much wealth we can hold. Here are the reasons that I will briefly discuss. The first one is that much wealth that people hold is tainted. That means that the, the way in which that wealth was produced violated basic moral, um, basic moral principles. I mean, textbooks examples are the transatlantic slavery, uh, what happened after um, after emancipation of the enslaved was actually not that they were compensated for all the years of unpaid work, but that those who were the so-called masters were often compensated. And uh, hence, um, there is a question, even if, for example, some of us would now receive an inheritance about the origins of that, um, of that wealth. Uh, and for example, there is in, in the UK, uh, there is a family, I hope I pronounce this correctly, the Trevelyan family, who discovered that their wealth, their family wealth actually goes back to enslaved people in uh, the Caribbean and who have, once they discovered this, decided that they should actually uh, engage in reparations. So they give it uh, back to the communities where it comes from. But slavery is really, I mean, the kind of first example in a long range of examples where you could see that, that money is tainted. And I have colleagues who actually think that all money is tainted. I, don't, I think there are possibilities that not all money is tainted, but I do think if you dig into all these cases of corruption and, and um, all sorts of dodgy practices that actually, and also, for example, all money that is to some extent still in the pocket of a person because of tax evasion and tax avoidance, 
uh, there's much more money that stays in there than, than, than we think than, than we normally believe. But I'll leave that uh, that first reason um, there. I just want to say that if money is tainted, the right reaction would be reparations or compensation, and that means that the wealth holding of those who hold it would be smaller. The second is uh, the second reason for uh, opposing wealth concentration and thinking that there is a problem with the wealth concentration that we now have is that the political choices that have enabled extreme wealth concentration are at the same time the choices that prevent us from sufficiently addressing poverty. And this is actually the argument that you often hear from neoliberal politicians on its head, because their argument is, if you let the uh, entrepreneurial people engage in activities that then will let the pie grow, the economic pie, it will lift the poor out of poverty and everybody will be better off. And I think the data uh, that we have about global poverty do show that if you use the very, very low absolute poverty measure, the number of people in poverty has fallen dramatically. But there are a couple of problems with, that, with, with those data. First of all, that, that poverty line is way too low. And another problem is that it is not the only question we should ask. The question we should ask is what alternative realistic worlds would have been possible apart from the one we come from and the one we are and what we see is that, for example, with um, globalization and the global economy, the lion's share of the divisions of the production that we've made together has gone to the global north and particularly to the richest people. And we've given breadcrumbs to people in the global south. And for example, people who sue our clothes are still today often not receiving a wage on which they can have uh, a decent life. So the question I think we should ask is not um, in comparison with earlier, have their life approved? But the question should be, what different scenarios of both production and division would have been possible, and which one would have been the one that we actually could have chosen but have not chosen? And there is a fantastic book also written by the uh, Princeton sociologist, uh, sociologist Matthew Desmond. It's called Poverty, Comma, by America. And he also argues that many of the policies that the American government um, enacted in the last uh, decades were favored towards the rich. It's not just tax deduction, which is a big problem, but also, for example, housing ownership policies. If you are very poor, there's, you, don't, you can't profit from housing owner policies. Um, and he, he, I think he makes the point, which is correct, that when it concerns these fiscal issues, there is an element of zero-sum game. Because if you uh, allow uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion and you reduce taxation on the, the richest or on the middle class, it means you have fewer tax revenue, which means you have less money for social housing and other things that could help the worst off. So in that sense, I think we should really stress that these are political choices. So. The world that I would favor is one in which we would make different economic and political choices and the, we would uh, then go for a scenario with um, less inequality and this should be able to lift more people out of poverty. The third reason to um, argue against extreme wealth is that it uh, can undermine democracy. Um, it can in the sense that any wealth holder can do things that can help to undermine democracy, and it does undermine democracy to a certain extent because we have all the, the scholarship by political scientists who indicate the mechanisms through which that goes. One of these mechanisms is funding, funding of political parties. Um, this is again a, a problem that is different for different countries. For example, in continental Europe, there's much more strict leg legislation to the, the extent to which you can as an individual fund a political uh, party. In my own country, the Netherlands, actually right now, you cannot give more than 100,000 euros per person per year to political parties. Whereas, of course, we know that, for example, in the US, it's, it's limitless. You, you can just give as much as you want. 
But funding is only one way in which you can uh, buy your own favorite candidates into politics. There is lobbying. You can hire a lobbyist if you have the money to hire a lobbyist, and they will then um, defend your favorite policies in parliament. And then there is a whole range of other things you can do, like uh, sponsor special chairs in universities, or buy up certain media that will uh, be um, uh, favor a certain view on uh, the economy or the world. And hence, the saying that, um, that you can basically transfer economic power in political power, I think um, is supported by what we know from, um, from how uh, the very rich use their money to um, influence politics. And one way in which they influence politics is by is in the area of climate change. So some of the um, some of the biggest uh, problems that we now see with having effective climate change, at least over the last uh, decades, is the climate denial machinery. That's a term used in the in the literature that has been funded by um, people like the Koch brothers, uh, who basically wanted to undermine what came out of the scientific community in terms of knowledge on what needed to be done to counter climate change. And that is one, one way in which um, they are, the, those, the, rich, the rich who deny climate change because they have uh, financial stakes in the situation as it is, um, harm everybody else because I think, at least I take it as a given that uh, climate change is a serious well, I think it is just an existential emergency that we have, that we face as human species and other species are equally in trouble. But uh, extreme wealth is in other ways also incompatible with ecological sustainability. And the most straightforward way is the lifestyles of a super rich. So um, there is, a, we can calculate for each person what their carbon footprint is. If you look at the average carbon footprint per person on the whole world, it is around six ton. In Europe, it would be perhaps around 10 with a bit of differences between the countries. In, in African countries, except South Africa and the oil producing countries, uh, it is uh, one, one ton. Uh, but if we look at the top 1% in the world, it is 101 ton and it's increasing. So the research by uh, Lucas Chancel that was, for example, published in Nature last year, shows that the, the middle classes in rich countries are decreasing their carbon footprints, but the 1% is still increasing their carbon footprint. And then the top percent, as I saw, as we've seen earlier, is like millionaires. But if you look at billionaires, then some estimates say that their carbon footprint only from consumption goes up up to 8,000 tons. And then we haven't yet looked at their carbon footprint from investments. So this is a problem that um, it's not possible. It is theoretically possible. It is, I should say, it's theoretically possible to be extremely rich and to stay within your fair carbon budget. But the data show that it's, these are extreme exceptions of those who do it. Uh, and I argue in the book why uh, other measures that have been advocated by, uh, mainly by economists um, won't be enough to uh, counter the problem that uh, having a lot of money means for ecological sustainability. And we can come back to that if that's of interest. Um, but in the interest of time, I will move on. Um, another uh, reason why I think we should resist extreme wealth concentration is a classic utilitarian argument, namely, it is wasteful. If you, have, if you have a low income or very little wealth, and you get an additional thousand pounds, it will really make a big difference. But if you earn a million, or three million, or five million, what does a thousand pounds mean? It means nothing. And that is because of what we know from uh, economics and, and political philosophy, the declining marginal utility of uh, income, if you already have a lot, having a bit more really doesn't make a difference. So um, we would much better spend that money, you could call it surplus money or excess money, that really doesn't add to the quality of life of the super rich to addressing urgent needs. And those urgent needs could be 
global poverty, but they could also be collective action problems such as uh, the climate emergency. And there are, of course, um, also very wealthy people who agree with this fifth reason, and that's the reason why they give away their money. I have for the book interviewed a number of, of uh, multimillionaires and some of them, I mean, some of them also think that the argument from democracy is really the most important argument. They're really worried about, um, about um, that it's, that politics is, well, in the US actually political scientists already say that they no longer have a democracy, they have an oligarchy, um, but they're worried also that this is going to only get worse and worse. Um, so some, some of these very rich people worry about democracy, but all others really are less politically oriented, but think about, uh, yeah, that it's just wasteful. And then comes the last argument, which is the most philosophical, and that is that it is morally undeserved. And this is something that I've, I've encountered is, the mo is kind of, for many people, um, quite challenging, because it's, it tends not to be the way we look at ourselves. What do I mean when I say it's morally undeserved? There are two ways to, to argue for this. And one is that the role of luck in our lives is much, much bigger than we tend to acknowledge. So there is what uh, John Rawls, the famous philosopher, argued the natural lottery, which is the talents you're born with, uh, any health issues you're born with. But I think we could also say the energy levels you're born with, which are also, you just see that some people have much higher energy levels than other people. And if you have those things, of course, it's rewarded in the system that we have because it makes it possible, possible for you to become economically very successful. But the question is, does that mean that you deserve it? No, because you didn't create yourself. You were just very lucky in the natural lottery. So the right attitude, I think, would not be one of saying, I did this, but would be one of saying, I've been very lucky that I had these talents, that I had these, these energy levels and so forth. And that's the natural lottery, but then you also have the social lottery. Your parents, the class in which you were born, the country in which you were born, the environment in which you were born. So, um, psychologists who study child development say that the most important years for us, or days, are the first 1,000 days of our lives. That's really when a lot is decided on how uh, good our lives will be. But how much can we be held responsible for the first 1,000 days of our life? We're like babies and toddlers. So that means that so much is already decided by this natural lottery, by this social lottery, before we actually start to make our own decisions. And if you look, if you have that view of human nature, rather than the view of human nature that I think in the current culture, or if you want to use that terminology, the current ideology is put forward, then you start to look at things differently. That does not mean that we cannot be proud of for what we do. Yes, we can be proud, but you, we should, I believe we should be able to kind of bring together at the same time an appreciation of the immense role of luck in our lives and at the same time still be proud, but then acknowledge that, that, that the fact that we made achievements does not mean that we should just uh, reap whatever the system allows us to, to get. And a second way in which I think uh, that uh, we cannot so easily say that we deserve what we can reap on the market is that a lot of what we can do is enabled by what previous generations made for us. Um, so there is all the technologies that have been made by uh, often investments by governments. I mean, here in London, there is the uh, the uh, economist of innovation, Mariano Mazzucato, has done fantastic research on explaining how the government really plays an important role in enabling um, all of us to access these technologies and institutions. And I guess uh, a thought experiment that may help us to really grasp how important that is, is suppose you have um, a boat and you put Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and a couple of these other guys on the boat. And um, you bring them to an island that has, it, you can survive there, there's cocos, coconuts and etc. but there's nothing. And they go there. Or in the second scenario, 
they go to an island that just looks like Britain today, but by some magical trick, all the people who live there actually have just left. And perhaps they've gone off to space to conquer the galaxy, I don't know. But, and then think about what they could do in those two different scenarios. It's obvious that if you land in a, on an island that has all the infrastructure that we have today, that you can do much more. You can have a much better quality of life, have a much higher welfare and so on. So that means that we tend to again individualize what we can do in the economy and what we can do in life, but so much is really the structures. Now my time is up, so I'll just say a few final sentences about, no I can't move this, let me just see. Okay, without, I'll tell you now how I come to this 10 million and the 1 million uh, limits. Um, the, one, the 10 million is really the question to the answer. If we want to try to damage or to minimize these harmful effects of having too much money, where should we put that limit? And at the same time, allow for enough room for those who are motivated mainly by earning money so that they will basically contribute to uh, be entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and work and so on. And I totally um, accept that we do not have an answer to that question. I just say, okay, for the sake of discussion, I propose 10 million, and this is up for debate. The second number that I gave you, 1 million is the answer to the question that I think each of us could ask and should ask, which is, when is it enough for me? That, the answer to that question depends on where you live. Because I live in a country with a, a universal pension, a decent and high quality semi-public healthcare system, and, and still a very good educational system without private schooling. And that means I do not need to save for my children to go to private uh, schooling, or I do not need to pay for uh, private uh, healthcare. So if the infrastructure is good, you need less. If, however, of course, you need to save for your own pension, and if, you, and if there is less, uh, a less robust welfare state, you may have to save more. And then the, the second big factor is, of course, the housing market. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, we are in London. So um, that is a different uh, situation. But we did research, uh, I did together with my colleagues in economic sociology research on where the Dutch would draw that line. And we found that, first of all, just like all of you, everybody somewhere says now it's enough, that most people tended to gravitate towards, uh, that was a study from 2018 and we found the equivalent of 1 million per person. So at 12% inflation, that's where we are for the Netherlands. So I think um, I, I have given you these numbers because I don't want to say let's eliminate billions. No, I think we should really go for a much lower number. But what is most important for me is that we ask the question, what kind of society do we want? And how much inequality do we want to tolerate in that society? And these are political choices that I think we as citizens should make. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Martin Sanbu. Uh, Martin is the Financial Times European economics commentator. Uh, he also writes for Free Lunch the FT's weekly newsletter on the global economic policy debate. He's been at the FT since 2009, when he joined the paper as economics leader writer. Before that, he worked in academia and uh, policy consulting. And he's also the author of three books on business ethics, on the euro, and on the economics of belonging. Martin, over to you. You, you want me there, yes? It's, it's yes. better, yeah. Apparently, the microphone is better there. Um, <laughs> So I'll have to step down so you can't see me, but presumably that means you'll hear me better. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's a really interesting book, and it's a pleasure to uh, be allowed to respond to it. It's, it's an additional pleasure because I, I didn't know this, Ingrid, but, uh, but we're both uh, former supervisees of Amartya Sen, because I did my PhD under Amartya too. So, Everything that happens here is within the same uh, 
intellectual genealogy, if you like, uh, which, as you're about to see, is uh, ample and has room for disagreements. Um, I'm, I'm kind of half-jokingly guessing that since, since I'm from the FT, I was invited to come and defend the oligarchy, uh, which, <laughs> which, which I'm not going to do. Um, because I'm, uh, I'm very much in favor of taxing the rich more, and, and I have written many times about the need for a wealth tax and, and try to refute the arguments against one, a wealth tax being a tax on actual wealth as opposed to income from wealth. Um, so, so in a sense, we are, there's a lot we agree on here, uh, and yet I'm, I kind of feel frustrated by a lot of the argument here. So take this in the spirit, Ingrid, of, uh, of making the argument better. Um, like, like, I suppose many of you, uh, I kind of come out of a, an academic tradition of studying economics and, and philosophy. Um, so to me, just the word limitarianism, anything that ends in Arianism, uh, is supposed to denote something quite theoretically specified, like utilitarianism or prioritarianism or sufficientarianism or egalitarianism or utilitarianism. Uh, I probably said something twice there. Um, and, and I remain, after reading the book, uh, still a little bit unsure how firm or tight this concept is. Uh, so my overall take, just to kind of give it all away, is I see the argument here for taxing the rich more, and I agree with it. I'm not sure I see the argument for something specific called limitarianism. Um, and, and I think this matters, right? What, what is it actually we're being asked to believe here? We can, of course, talk about what's enough. That's a psychological question, a moral question, a political question, and so on. Um, but, but just to kind of really, really highlight my, um, my frustration here, I'll just read out one little passage from the end of the book where, where Ingrid comes to, you know, so we've had all these arguments that she's very nicely summarized. Things are bad. They need to be made better. A lot of it has to do with unacceptable wealth concentration, what should we do about it? Uh, and so there's this, there's this little passage here. Those who oppose libertarianism or who oppose any kind of progress towards equality will caricature this point of view by simplistically reducing it to a single proposal, such as 100% highest marginal tax rate on income to be able to vent it in full tomorrow. This is silly and should be seen as no more than a rather poor attempt to discredit libertarians. We need a patchwork of measures, none which will be perfect on its own, but which taken together will help us reach our goal. Um, so I read that and I scratched my head a bit because I thought that, you know, of course, there's a holistic uh, view here, but surely it also means something like 100% tax, either above some income level or some wealth level. And if it doesn't mean that, if you're not committed to that, and I don't see words in the book committing you to that, uh, but we'll have a discussion so you can tell me, uh, then I'm kind of left wondering a bit, what is it we're supposed to, to believe here? Um, it becomes something much vaguer. I mean, my naive take was, well, limitarianism, 10 million, if that's the right number, it probably means 100% tax rate on wealth above 10 million. It's kind of the intuitive first take on it. And then, of course, that raises a lot of questions. Does that mean it's okay to make five million a year as long as you spend it all so that you never add to your wealth? You keep your wealth at 9,999,999, and then you blow five million a year or whatever your very high income is on, on great things for you. I don't know. Is that? That's obviously not in the spirit of what this is supposed to be. But all those questions, uh, there would be one way to take this discussion that's in the frame of the quite theoretical discussion you've had in the economics and philosophy space. That's not in the book, at least, uh, and I would like to hear more. Um, instead, what there is uh, are a lot of very good refutations of any silly claim that we need to keep wealth distributions the way they are. You, you, know, you write about a lot of these things that you observe about society and the effects of wealth. Um, <coughs> But it seems to me that a lot of the arguments that you make uh, and a lot of the problems you identify are primarily arguments for some other things. It's not clear to me that they are arguments for 
you know, a cap on acceptable wealth, if, if that's what libertarianism means, strictly speaking and, and concretely. Uh, you know, of course, a lot of wealth is tainted. Uh, you know, some people also get tainted money and are not rich. Um, and the right answer to that is that we should prevent that. We should have reparations, we should have compensation, we should uh, put thieves in jail and so on. Um, but that's got nothing to do with, you know, how much they've made. That's just saying, well, we need to restitute wrongfully acquired money, no matter how much it is. Um, we can talk about wealth and democracy. I think this is perhaps the most powerful argument. It's extremely important. But there are, of course, policies to insulate democracy from wealth. You mentioned one, the, uh, the campaign uh, donation limits uh, in the Netherlands. We can have a lot of these, these policies. Um, and we can say similar things about a lot of these other problems. There are actually other policies that are the direct answers to these problems. Even the poverty problem, well, it's a argument for putting more resources into tackling poverty. You know, whether that means ending up with nobody having more than 10 million, I, I don't know. You know, we'd, we'd have to find out. Uh, it does mean taxing more, probably, and taxing the rich more, definitely. Whether it means limitarianism, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, in the book, I read Ingrid as basically uh, doubting, perhaps for good reasons, the political realism of all these other policies, the policies that don't have to do with limiting how much wealth anyone can have. For example, insulating electoral democracy from money, um, or restituting wrongfully gained money, all of these things. Um, and that may well be, but in terms of politics, uh, it's not clear that it's terribly politically realistic to have a cap on wealth either, right? So either we're in the realm of arguing for what should be done, and then let's try to think of the politics around that, uh, or we are talking about, well, what can we politic polit politically achieve you know, with this manifesto at this election, and so on. Uh, and you, know, you have to do the work in, in both cases, but let's at least be clear about which, which framework are we trying to debate inside. Um, so you can't just say that there are, or answer to me when I say, well, there are all these other policies that we need to have, uh, and say, well, it's not politically realistic that we'll be able to stop the influence of money on elections, for example. So instead, we need to have libertarianism, because then I'll say, well, show me that that's any more politically realistic. Uh, so that's, there needs to be a theory of politics somewhere here, it seems to me. Now, that's for the politics. Now, what about the policy? Um, I was saying, and I want you to just give a few more examples, that a lot of the arguments in the book are very good arguments for very good policies for making this economy into a nicer, better, fairer, greener uh, support for society. So a lot of things I agree with. Uh, but most of these things we would agree with completely regardless of what we think about the specific principle about limiting the wealth anyone can have. Um, and that goes even for the most direct, the most directly related point, which is that large inequality perpetuates poverty. Sure, you know, I agree with that, so we should redistribute more. But you can think that you need to redistribute more without thinking that that means the, pr the, the first thing to look at, or the most important thing, the most important measure of how successful we are is whether we allow anyone to own more than 10 million. I will note uh, as a fact that, you know, it's interesting to try to understand, measured wealth inequality is higher in Norway and Sweden than it is in the UK. Most of you didn't know that, I bet. Uh, I submit that poverty problems, they obviously exist in Scandinavia too, but I think they are bigger in the UK than in Scandinavia. Uh, so again, What's the relation here, even for a policy that is so, that is directly to do with inequality and redistribution? But then take other policies, tax havens. Uh, very good arguments why we need to shut down, crack down on tax havens. You know, tax, tax evasion, the criminal bit, people should go to jail. Tax avoidance, we should make sure we close all the loopholes and so on. Um, I mean, it would be nice to hear Ingrid's thoughts about the progress that has actually been made on this, on corporate tax, international corporate taxation in the last couple of years. 
Um, but you can believe that without having any particular view about what the right tax structure is. Right? You might think that the, wealth, the wealthy should be taxed less, but they should be paying what the spirit of the tax law says that they should pay. So you might think it's perfectly consistent to say marginal tax rates should be lower, but they should be paid. So again, you know, lots of people uh, will want to close tax havens. It seems to me that, at least in terms of political strategy and in terms of policy advocacy, you know, go, go with that. Let's just close the tax havens, not because it's necessary in order to stop anyone from having more than 10 million, but because they're, they're wrong, no matter what we think the tax system should be. Um, and then finally, it can be even worse. So I don't, uh, I don't think I agree with the arguments, the argument from ecological sustainability. I certainly think that we need to get to net zero faster than what we're planning. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, guilty as charged among the economists to think that a really, really tough carbon tax would get us quite a lot of the way. Um, but I don't think libertarianism was get, would get us anywhere in that direction. And here is why. Um, so I, I can't remember if you quote this statistic in the book, but it's, it's sort of a famous statistic out there that 50% of the world's population emit 10% of the carbon and 10% emit 50%, right? Super unequal. Uh, it's, it's sort of equivalent to the statistics you gave. So no debate there that this is very, very unequal and has to do with you know, lifestyles that we would condemn and so on. Uh, but it's about the same and possibly even less unequal than the distribution of actual wealth. It's probably more in it Italian than the distribution of emissions. Both awful, you know, I'm not saying that makes it better or anything. But think about this. So suppose you did redistribute, right? Uh, if you redistribute from the rich to the poor, it's presumably so that the poor will have more resources and be less poor. That's what it is to be less poor, right? Um, emissions follow consumption. The rich emit far too much because they consume a lot. So when you redistribute, well, then you'll be moving the consumption. It'll be more just because you'll have fewer poor people and fewer extremely wealthy people. It's not clear to me that you would emit any less. Probably you would emit more because the wealthy save more. They consume a lower proportion of their incomes. And as you, as you redistribute, you may get consumption to go up. But the point isn't really this. The point is simply uh, these things are not necessarily linked. And I think we might actually harm the interests that we may have in common, both in thinking about where the wealth concentration should be uh, addressed and diminished, and whether we should save the planet by mixing them when they don't actually mix in the way set out here. Okay, finally, I think I've gone uh, over my time. So I've sort of done a political criticism, a policy criticism, well, conceptual political policy. Let me just return to this point about uh, morality, because the, uh, the most appealing, I think, most certainly easiest to understand sense of libertarianism is as an ethical principle. Um, and the whole uh, argument about extreme wealth not being deserved uh, goes into this. Ingrid is completely right. right? Luck has a lot to do with it. Wrongfulness has a lot to do with it. The rich don't, reserve, don't deserve their extreme wealth. But if you phil take philosophically, if you philosophically take seriously this argument, you're going to end up concluding that, well, you know, no distribution of wealth or income is deserved. The whole concept of desert doesn't really work. So I don't think it actually takes us anywhere. It does demolish a silly argument for respecting the wealth distribution we happen to have as somehow deserved. It's not deserved, but nothing else is deserved either. Uh, dessert isn't really something that can get us anywhere in distributive justice. It can get us somewhere, I think, in maybe individual moral theory and, of course, in practical politics. It's powerful language. Um, but, but ending, then, with this, this idea that maybe there's an ethical principle here, that we as individuals should uh, feel or accept or acknowledge a moral duty not to have more than whatever the right number is. 
Well, I would want to hear something about how that duty works in a society where not everyone respects it, the difference between ideal theory and non-ideal theory. Um, uh, but I'd like to just kind of finish on a, a sort of provocative question. Um, I think when, when, when you were all made to stand up at the beginning, it was a nice exercise. I, uh, I, I stayed seated to kind of express my right not to take part in what I think was a shaming exercise. Um, I think the idea here was to make you feel bad, and especially the few people who stood up the longest. Um, so, so here's a question. Um, this book is, is published by Penguin Allen Lane. So it's one of the biggest publishers in the world, extremely influential in terms of what we read, what gets published, and so on. And, and I wish uh, Ingrid a lot of success with the book. Now, the question is, in your contract with Penguin, so did you put in something about what if it's a bestseller? So it says here it retails for 25 pounds, so how many copies do you get to 10 million? 400,000, yes? Um, I mean, is there anything, is this the way we should think about it in our individual lives, if we are very successful? So apart from, you know, the really mean rich people, people who are successful out of luck, because it's luck usually, uh, what are the obligations we have? So, you know, what did you put in, in case it's a huge bestseller? Did you require the book to be sold for free after the 400,000th copy? Did you ask for something from Penguin in terms of how they should use their resources? Did you, I don't know, I'd be curious to know. Um, now, I've been super mean to you and I've gone over my time. <laughs> So I'll just, just, I'll just finish by saying that you know, all of these reflections I've shared now are, I've sort of played my role of being the, the, the aggressive foil to the argument. Um, but that's how rich this book is, right? That it creates that kind of uh, thinking. So please, everyone, do read the book. Engage with it intellectually, whether you agree or not. But more importantly, engage beyond the intellectual bit and think about what it means for how you should act. Thank you very much. Um, so I move now swiftly to our uh, final panellist, um, Leah Poupi, who is a professor in political theory in the government department here at LSE. Uh, she's also adjunct associate professor in philosophy at the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University. She's an associate of the new cohesive capitalism program here at LSE funded by the Open Society Foundations. Um, which is, as I mentioned, co-hosting tonight's event. Before joining LSE, Leah was a postdoctoral prize fellow at the Nuffield College in Oxford and a researcher at the European University Institute where she obtained her PhD. Leah, over thank to you. you. Great, thank you. Um, so when I read Ingrid's book, which uh, I endorsed, <coughs> saying that it was a much needed manifesto, and I don't usually endorse books that I don't like, so it means I liked it. Uh, I actually was reminded of a poem, which I decided I'm going to read out to you now, because I'm sure that's why you come to the LSE on a Wednesday evening, so you have poetry in your lives. Uh, it's actually a very short poem, so I'll, I'll read the poem and then I'll say something about the book. So the poem goes like this, and maybe you'll recognize it, and either you will love it or you will hate it, both are fine. It's reasonable. You can grasp it. It's simple, you're no exploiter, so you'll understand. It's good for you, look into it. Stupid men call it stupid, and the dirty call it dirty. It's against dirt and against stupidity. The exploiters call it a crime, but we know it's the end of crime. It's not madness, but the end of madness. It's not chaos, but order. It's the simple thing that's hard to do. Now, for those that haven't recognized the poem, it's by Bertolt Brecht. And the title of the poem is In Praise of Communism, and it was written in 1931. Now, it turns out communism is not as simple as Brecht writes in those lines, as he himself discovered. 
I think Ingrid's proposal is a little bit more simple than that, and uh, also very, very plausible, as Brecht says, in particular if you're not an exploiter and if you don't like the kinds of things that Ingrid was um, mentioning in her talk. It's in fact so simple that you wonder when you read it, why did nobody think about it? And uh, as it happens, someone did think about it. That was Plato in the Laws many, many centuries ago in a book that was the more compromising, less radical version than the other book that was actually a praise of communism, which is the Republic, and that's why it's lesser known book, The Laws, than the Republic. And Plato was suggesting in that book that the uh, richest citizen in the uh, Magnesia, in the island that he was discussing in The Laws, should never earn more than four times the wage of the uh, poorest citizen. Now, we're a long way from Plato, because it turns out that Jeff Bezos actually earns the salary of one of his employees every nine seconds. So that's, um, as I say, we kind of, if it was needed at the time of Plato, it sounds like it's even more needed now. now. And libertarianism belongs to a family of views that is egalitarian in spirit, in that it thinks that uh, we are inspired by theories of justice that look at the world around us and try to make it just that little bit less unequal than it currently is now. And it effortlessly helps the egalitarian cause in that even if you're not specifically going to defend or endorse or be on board with every aspect of the libertarian proposal, it's a very valuable book even if you're an egalitarian, broadly speaking, because it effortlessly destroys all the usual objections that you will encounter against egalitarianism, broadly speaking, uh, both in philosophical discourse but also more commonly in political discourse. She works through uh, both philosophical and empirical literature, and so she dismantles all the various objections that you might have. So the idea, for example, that limitarianism is motivated by a politics of envy, or the fact that, as we've heard, it undermines desert, or the fact that it undermines the kind of fair reward that people deserve for their labor. And you know, you'll be familiar with the libertarian objection to egalitarianism, which is that every taxation is theft, and in that spirit, um, Ingrid's proposal would also count as theft because it would enable the state or whatever authority to take away from people above a certain limit. She undermines the myth of the trickle down, that you know a lot of wealth actually trickles down and turns into resolving some of our uh, problems in the world. She also suggests that philanthropy is not enough, which is one of the other standard uh, responses that you'll get if you suggest egalitarian proposals to uh, to the public that is not inherently egalitarian. They'll say, well, but surely if you have a lot of wealth, it will at some point trickle down to the poor, and uh, she argues for a kind of action that is both structural, so ethically desired, but also structural, uh, fiscal, act at the taxation level, and so on. And there are two objections that one could broadly make to the, or at least all the objections you can think about making to this proposal will fall into one of two answers. One is that it's too radical, and the other one that it's not radical enough. And since I was hoping that Martin was going to defend the first one, and I had decided to say something against the, uh, you know, the second one is not radical enough, but Martin shied away from that, I am actually now, in the first part of my comments, going to defend the oligarchs and give you a kind of response that someone who would want to reject uh, limitarianism on the basis of wanting to actually defend the, the idea that sky should be the limit, or rather there should be no limits uh, because the sky has no limits. Uh, so I'm going to say something about what someone like that might actually say against that proposal, and then I'll say something for the other view, which is that it's not radical enough. So what would someone that wants to say that limitarianism is too radical suggest in response to Ingrid's question? In my experience, the most plausible and philosophically interesting response to all families of egalitarian theories is actually one that thinks about human nature and uh, our assumptions about human nature and the kinds of assumptions about human nature that we make in society when we think about wealth distribution. And it's particularly pertinent to limitarianism, especially if you are someone like me who has actually lived in a limitarian society, uh, which is communist Albania. And I'm sure some of you will have equally also lived in some kind of real world libertarian society, or some of you will have parents that will um, have lived in that kind of libertarian society. And the kind of thing that you experience in that society is that even though there is a limit on wealth, so nobody actually uh, can acquire more wealth than anyone else, that's just the way the world is constructed for you, there begin to emerge little differences that signal power, power differentials between people. So you don't actually 
care about wealth, but you care about signaling some difference in status that suggests that you are higher above than someone else. So in my own uh, book and, and uh, story that I tell, it's about a Coca-Cola can, which in communist Albania was a symbol of a status of having acquired some object that other people didn't have. Sometimes it was about the kind of brand of swimming costume that you'd have and whether it had a little S for speedo on it. In other cases, it was some other irrelevant object. So usually it was a kind of symbolic aspect to this. But the idea was that every self-evaluation is comparative somehow. And so the esteem in which you're held by others is also comparative relational. And the assumption that that kind of society seemed to support is that there is something about human beings that always want to compare to other people and that libertarianism would actually put a cap on that. And in fact, it counts. So even if it puts a cap on wealth, there will always be a way in which people will signal to others that they are a little bit higher above. Now, in the case of communist Albania, if you were someone who worked in a kind of clothes selling shop, for example, and you were the first to find out that there was a supply of uh, clothes or new clothes that year, because it was all central planning, you were held in very high esteem by society. You had a, a shopkeeper had a lot of power in communist Albania, just because they could signal to people that, you know, I know when things are coming, you talk to me, I do a favor to you by giving you something before other people buy it, because it will run out, and so on and so forth. And so it was basically, as I say, it was an example that these differences will emerge, whatever we do about placing caps, because there is something about human nature that is intrinsically driven by comparative relations, and that this kind of proposal, and in particular the kind of libertarian version of it, is against human nature. And that's why it doesn't work, it's because it's against human nature. And I find that is, uh, as I say, the kind of um, most plausible version of the uh, objection against egalitarianism more broadly, but libertarianism more specifically that I have heard, and um, so I was wondering whether, limit, uh, whether Ingrid, you have thoughts on how to address that objection, other than saying, like me, well, I just have a different view of human nature. In which case, if you do have a different view of human nature, you end up in a very different place, because then you end up in a very, very radical proposal. And so you end up in now in the second uh, horn of the objection that I'm going to press against uh, Ingrid, which is that it's actually not radical enough. Mm -hmm. Because even though, uh, because once we sort of say, well, we want to have a different view of human nature, then sky's the limit in terms of the views that we have. And so then we could be much more demanding. And so then the objection becomes, what is the connection between a proposal that tries to limit wealth and alternative views that try to restructure market, restructure society, think about rearranging the distribution of power within states, and so fundamentally changing the juridical, constitutional, socio-economic order of society. So something like, I don't know, abolishing capitalism would be my favorite solution. <laughs> so, uh, so the question is then, once we, as I say, once we kind of come up with this alternative view of human nature, uh, by which I don't mean, and Ingrid has a part in her book where she says she's not in favor of uh, abolishing markets, she's not in favor of abolishing private property. I think a socialist is also not in favor of these things. It's all about how you set up structural constraints in society and how you orient institutions. Typically, a socialist proposal would be, let's uh, have common ownership of the great means of production, which is exactly what billionaires and the kinds of people that Ingrid wants to um, somehow challenge in their wealth and power, that's also what they have. And so usually, there is a kind of correspondence between the owners of the great means of production and the type of people that we would want to challenge with our libertarian proposal, in which case, why not go with the simpler version of full anti-capitalism rather than with this, um, with this type of proposal. So how does, in what way does your suggestion differ, if at all, from these kind of full-blown anti-capitalist alternatives? And in what way does your view of human nature differ, if at all, from those kinds of um, alternatives? Okay, um, two more questions. One is about uh, the kind of politics that libertarianism requires. So it seems to me that in your book, Ingrid, you are very uh, critical of neoliberal economics, but I'm not sure that you're as critical of neoliberal politics and in particular of the neoliberal conception of the person. Because ultimately, um, this is a book that makes appeal to a certain view of the individual, 
namely the kind of morally responsible individual. But there is very little in the book about collectives and about the type of politics that limitarianism requires. So does limitarianism actually have a view of society, by which I mean a view of the kind of political society? Or how would one, how do you envisage realizing these limitarian proposals out there in an environment that is generally pretty hostile, where people who have a lot of wealth and power will usually do whatever they can to defend their privileges? And so we know that politics is not easy. We know that people who have interests to defend will defend their interests, that there is a kind of struggle what are the kinds of collectives on which libertarianism requires to promote its campaign or its proposals or its manifesto or whatever? And should any of these collectives be organized along political lines or can this view be appropriated ideologically by a right, left, center, anyone? So is there a difference in how we think about this view? So, uh, so as I say, as I, as I say, you're very critical, rightly, of, as I say, neoliberal economics, but I'm not really sure that the book has a kind of non-neoliberal view of politics. And so I wanted to just press you on that. And then the final thing, the final thought, and I think I might have asked you this when we were last discussing this in um, Australia. There's a lot of things that you can limit. And usually, um, limitarian, so limitarianism in your project is about wealth, but usually, People who are very, very wealthy have states behind them. And uh, usually their interests are defended by their states and by a whole kind of political apparatus. And usually, as you were pointing out yourself, that wealth comes up out of you know, imperialist expansion or exploitation or accumulation and so on. That means that there are also huge differences in the uh, power that states have. So if we're going to have a limitarian view, why have that view just about wealth? I might say, I would like to have a libertarian view on weapons, for example. There's a lot of people out there who, are not, who don't have enough guns to defend themselves. And we allow states to concentrate and build nuclear powers and have a highly developed technology and so on. But we don't put a limit on how many weapons they can have. And yet this really affects how they can defend themselves. And also whether they can defend or not the um, individuals that are actually supported by these states. So why would this view, and in part this kind of connects, I guess, to my previous question about uh, the individual and, and so on, but why would the view want to limit wealth rather than any other metric along which we could measure power, like military, like land, like resources, like, anyway, so all that. Okay, thank you, that's it. Thank you. and I know that Ingrid has got copious notes and she's just dying to have an opportunity to respond but I'm not going to give her that opportunity just yet because you've all been uh, listening and uh, been very patient so if you'd like to ask a question make a comment please raise a hand a uh, roving microphone will be brought to you please say your name and your affiliation if any I'm going to collect together three questions and then uh, ask the, the panel to respond. So there's um, a, a, a woman here with glasses, long hair on the left. And then we can go to the gentleman with glasses and a grey jumper at the, towards the back. Thank you. So this question is for Professor Ingrid. So uh, obviously I agree with taxing the rich, but don't you think 100% tax? There are so many youngsters today in society that in the future will contribute towards our society. If you're capping a limit on how much they are going to maybe earn or their wealth, it's, it's don't you think for entrepreneurs, the sky is the limit. So if you're capping it, you're also capping their productivity and the productivity that's going to happen in society in the future, which means that if you're decreasing the productivity, in turn, you're also going to be increasing the poverty line because if people know that, they're not going to get a return after a certain amount, like you proposed 10 million, I think. So why would they put in more effort, and why would they why would they want why would there be growth in society after a certain point? Okay. Oh, then Jack Barnett from uh, the Times Economics Correspondent. Uh, probably maybe one more for you, Martin. Obviously, there's a bit of agreement across the panel here that that wealth inequality in the UK is is pretty severe at the moment. I'm just wondering whether or not what the panel would. Uh, think that an incoming Labour government would be the first policy that they should enact in order to reduce that inequality. Uh, probably two parts of that question. What do you think they should do, and then what do you think within the realm of political possibility 
what they actually can do. Okay, uh, thank you. In the front here. And thank you. I'm Antonius from UCL. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, thank you for the beautiful poem about uh, communism that Leia read. So uh, uh, Milton Friedman said that don't judge the policy from its intention, but from its output. And Stephen Pinker also said that we, we, we have a good progress of like a capitalism and democracy. So like, uh, is it? Is it okay to to like uh, approach uh, this case as a thought experiment, and what's what's your like uh, uh, argument about about that? So because like uh, yeah like uh, uh, what uh, Martin and Leah said like uh, uh, yeah maybe it got it got worse maybe like uh, yeah thank you thank you so do you want to respond briefly Ingrid? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll leave the question about what labor should do to the people who live in the UK. Um, uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to the, the first question about, uh, so I, I'm not advocating necessarily a 100% income tax. I mean, I, the, the reason why I put the quote you said uh, in the book is because uh, that is actually how some economists in the Netherlands responded to me without ever having read any of the publications I've done on this topic. So I, I say also in the book that it's the way you organize society actually already um, influences how the disparity will be. So what some uh, people call um, pre-distribution measures. Um, there, is, there are, 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 however, loads of people in the world who have an income cap because they are, um, they are, for example, scientists and they, that means you only have, you can go up to a certain level. They also put in 60 hours a week. So I just think this whole idea that we are only extrinsically motivated by having more money in order to contribute to, to the, the common good or productivity, I just think that is empirically proven to be wrong and thinking about the view of human nature, I also just think this is not the way we, most of us are. So, uh, and the other thing is, I do believe we haven't, none of, nobody so far has used the word ideology, but for me, quite a bit of my argument is really also how I think, I mean, Leah talked about human nature, you could say human nature falls into the ideology. We, the way we organize society, the way we have a public debate, also frames how we are going to look at ourselves. So there is, I quote in this book, this, uh, the person who uh, invented the first vaccine against polio, he was a scientist and he was asked, who has the patent? And he said, humanity has the patent, can you patent the sun? Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of, and he was not, I mean, as far as I, I don't know, perhaps he was a communist, we don't know, but it's just this, this view of why would we only be driven by just earning endlessly more. I just think that is also just not the way it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's more to respond, but I want to collect some more questions to give you a chance. So there's someone right in the middle at the back, please, and then here on the right, um, with his hand up, if we can get the microphones there. Keep your hands up, those two people, so we can get the microphones to you. My question is for Leah, essentially on the issue of human nature again. Uh, given that humanity uh, basically survived for 100,000 years without entering into hierarchical organizational structures, can we really say that human nature requires a hierarchy or uh, it's human nature to desire to show up on status? Okay, and here please. Hi, I'm taken back to a seminar which Tanya and I both were at when Wilkinson and Pickett introduced the spirit level at LSE. And their argument was a very convincing one, which is that inequality immiserates everybody, the rich and poor alike, because going back to our Coca-Cola cans and what Marjorie was talking about, comparison always makes you be looking up at those people who have the bigger yacht that you don't have or down at the people who have fewer Coca-Cola cans. And that is an extent inevitable even if the 
wealth differentials are compressed, but if the wealth differentials are compressed, then the differentials in power diminish. And it's the power over others which is crucial. Now, the problem with that is you, where, how do you break the circle? Because those people have the power and are not going to let us take away their money uh, unless we take, you quoted Brecht, one also might quote another communist, Lenin, what is to be done? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any other question? Yep, here on the left hand side, please. Okay, thank you so much. So this question is for Professor Ingrid. So I, uh, my question is regarding the moral foundation of your uh, limitarianism. So one objection I would uh, press is that I do not think that the concept of luck really supports uh, limitarianism in a philosophical sense, if we take it really philosophically and analytically. And because I think that luck and extreme wealth are not necessarily connected. They might be highly connected in today's world. The wealthiest people, they end up with wealthy families and wealthy backgrounds and that's, but it's a, high, a highly uh, correlation, not a necessarily you know, connected. So in that sense, luck can only uh, be a foundation of luck egalitarianism and not libertarianism. So basically, that's uh, one of the uh, objections I want to press. Yes, so the fun uh, moral foundation of libertarianism. Thank you. Uh, Leia, did you want to come in on human nature of that first question? Does, um, do, does human nature yeah. um, require a, a hierarchy? So I think, I mean, the, it's kind of music to my ears to hear that human nature can survive without hierarchical organization and comparisons. And in a way, I was sort of reporting what I hear, an objection that is often put to me rather than something I believe in. I personally believe that human nature changes. However, I think I wanted to connect to something that Ingrid was saying, which is ideology is actually just a naturalization of assumptions about other people that we make. And so the fact that this is the most pervasive objection that you will get to something like a radical egalitarian uh, proposal in society now, it may not be about human nature more generally, but it certainly is about what people naturalize about human beings and their social relations. And actually, you know, when Rousseau was trying, uh, citing earlier, talking about how when he thinks about comparisons and so on, he thinks that's all society, capitalism, that Amour proper is something that's born with commercial society. It wasn't like that when people were living in a different kind of society. But in a way, it's neither here nor there for us, because in our societies now, this is what people naturalize. So what are we going to do about that argument, and how are we going to respond to it, and, what, and should we not have a kind of wider conversation and confront it head on rather than sort of be distracted by the, by the margins? Because I think that's the kind of, the, in the end, all these other objections boil down to this one and to a fundamentally different intuitions about humans. But I'm very sympathetic to the question and to the answer. Thanks. And um, Ingrid, did you want to come in on whether luck drives us to luck egalitarianism rather than to limitarianism? Um, yes, but um, I actually wanted to say something about the type of argument. So in philosophy, often with the type of arguments which we take to be uh, successful arguments are often um, deductive arguments and the kind of arguments that I'm presenting in the book uh, they are what uh, some uh, people who do argumentation theory would call abductive ab no, not abductive ab yeah ab adjective arguments so that you you look at what the evidence it's also what what people in legal in legal uh, co context use you look at what the evidence suggests and there may be cases like I said about the, you can be environmentally, you can be super rich and not be, have a, and still have a low environmental um, uh, footprint, but the, the statistics, the large numbers do not show it. And if you think about, if you make a societal critique, which I think in the end this is, it's not about pure logic, the way we often do that in philosophy, but it is about what does the weight of the evidence suggest. So there are some people who call this also the, I don't know for a better word, but what I found in the literature is a Swiss cheese argument, which is that you have, of course, Swiss cheese as, as holes, but I kind of every, although there may be arguments that do not apply to particular individuals, all, at least some of the arguments will apply to some of the individuals. And I think in the case of luck, 
uh, you can surely come up with uh, exceptions to what I've argued, but I still believe that uh, many of the people who, um, well, all the people who've been extremely successful economically have just had an enormous amount of luck. And this also brings us back to the question about uh, human nature and ideology, because I think what neoliberal ideology propagates is uh, not to focus on luck, but to focus on what we ourselves individually have contributed. And that's what I want to shift. Thanks. Uh, yep, there's uh, two at the front here, please, and then one in the middle, uh, yes, with the maroon t-shirt. So here, right at the front first, please. Say your name and... Uh, uh, Duncan Grant, I'm a student here at LSE. Um, you said your fundamental argument to justify libertarianism um, is the moral one that rich people simply don't deserve um, the riches that they have. That, which I agree with, but I think I worry that most people don't agree with that and it goes against the, this meritocratic idea which seems to have political consensus. Do, do you come up with a convincing argument against that meritocratic sense of I do deserve what I have as long as I haven't broken any rules because I, I feel like for this to catch on we're going to need to your we will need to to have a good convincing snappy argument to that to that point you pass the microphone just bump immediately behind you thanks um, I'm Jed was a student here at LSE and my argument is sort of in similar lines to Professor Rippies about the sort of states and the materium being too small. The argument you put forward, sort of living sustainably, money being tainted, inefficiency, lock on deserves, or perverting democracy, those seem to be arguments that could be applied to states as well. The US being the richest country in the world has done a lot to taint democracy in the global south. And when you talk about examples of the sort of the, the carbon footprints of people, that could also be applied to nations. So to what extent is this just degrowth in another or limited to that um, angle? So what is the dialogue between degrowth and libertarianism, for example? Thank you. And then in the, in the middle there. Right. Uh, I actually had a very similar point with the person who just spoke before me. So great to hear that. Um, essentially, I understood your argument, Professor Ingrid, as something that applied to individuals within nations. Um, and yet, when we look at the reasons that you're for libertarianism, it looks like a lot of these things are things that have created inequality between nations, okay. you know, things like slavery, imperialism, uh, the neoliberal project that's accelerated since the 1980s. And so looking at measures like you know, redistributing wealth through taxation within countries or measures like reorganizing systems of national production and consumption, are those things that would address um, the inequality that exists within countries, because those are very much the same arguments you'd be against, um, well, you'd be for libertarianism between countries, and if we wanted to take the view that libertarianism should apply between countries, would this be you know, reorganizing international systems of production consumption? It would have looked more at something like uh, taking a different metric, so for instance, GDP per capita or something like that. Essentially, how can we apply this argument to being both within, but also between nations. Thank you. Um, Martin, did you have any reflections? Um, many, but I'll, I'll try to be very, very quick. Um, two things, one on, um, so one on human nature, one on one meritocracy. Um, my take on human nature is that it, it's a little bit of a non sequitur. In a sense, it doesn't matter too much. So, okay, suppose human nature is such that we'll always compare uh, ourselves against one another. I mean, so what? That doesn't take away from the fact that extreme wealth concentration has harmful effects and that a better society would have less extreme wealth. Maybe we'll still, because the point isn't to stop people. If your argument was we need a society where nobody thinks anybody else has something they want, yeah, I mean, then you can, you might as well give up perhaps. But, but that's not the point, I don't think. And, you know, Ingrid and Leah may have different, different views on this, but to me it doesn't do anything to affect the, the strength, strengths or weaknesses for the arguments about libertarianism or any other distributive theory. Um, on meritocracy, um, 
I mean, it's one of these things that are politically a lot more powerful than they are philosophically powerful, uh, but that matters too. Uh, I mean, I think on, on the philosophical side, I mean, I think John Rawls got it right, right? We don't deserve things, but we have legitimate expectations uh, depending on the sort of social structures we live within. Uh, and so, you know, if you work hard and play by the rules, then you have some legitimate expectation to getting what those rules set up for you to get. But the more unjust that structure is to begin with, you know, the less you can say, you know, you, so you, you know, you win the, you win the succession contest in a totalitarian dictatorship, you know, that doesn't give you a legitimate expectation to, to run everything. So I think the sort of critiques that that Ingrid makes and these arguments make are about the structure of society. So any point about meritocracy, I think, has to be taken within, you know, it has to address the claim that the original structure is deeply flawed. So you can't just say, oh, I played by the rules. Well, the rules were very bad and we all have a responsibility to deal with that. Now, that doesn't mean I agree with what the answer is. Um, but I think it does make me think that uh, in most sensible, acceptable social structures, you know, there are cases to think that, you know, you could aspire to get quite rich and, and more than the levels that Ingrid wants, and that that's not a problem if a lot of these other challenges that you've rightly identified have been addressed. Somebody was mentioning power. I think that's, that's what it comes down to. For me, at least, it's uh, the greatest problem with excessive inequality uh, is if there are people in society against whom too much power is exercised by others, right? So if you can have a society that's where everyone is sufficiently free, free from power abuses by others or by institutions, then I don't care so much whether some people, you know, J.K. Rowling makes 100 million or whatever. Um, but that's how I would think about it. Thank you. Leo, any thoughts before I hand, I think, then to Ingrid to close with some final reflections. Yeah, maybe just a, just a quick response to Martin about the, um, the question of human nature, which I think is actually, I mean, I, I think it is a real, it's a real question because uh, you say, well, it's not about, you know, whether it's, we can have extreme wealth or not, it's about the structure of society. But the argument that the objector, that the libertarian objector would make, which I think is a very serious one, is the following, that wealth is a proxy for success, achievement of whatever kind. And by Ingrid's proposal, we would limit wealth. And therefore, the comparative relational dynamic would be eliminated from that side, but it will emerge on some other side. And so then, the people who say have the power to set the limit on wealth actually become the type of person that drives the metric of achievement. So you stop competing for money, but you compete for office, or you compete for influence, or you compete for being a shopkeeper in communist Albania. There's all kinds of dimensions that competition begins to take because of the comparative relational aspect. So I think this is why it's actually a key objection. I don't think you can just say to the object, what the objector is then saying, yes, but then who gives these authorities the freedom to establish that these are the rules by which society should be run and the power to establish those rules as opposed to just having a metric that's actually open to everyone and anonymous in its form and uh, yeah, that historically they would say has fared better. I think it's a very serious argument. So, I mean, I'm, you know, this is a, a kind of right-wing libertarian argument. I seem to take it way more seriously than many of my <laughs> egalitarian fellow <laughs> concerns. There is, a, there is a very famous article by G.A. Cohen where he says, why are Marxists so triggered by these libertarian arguments? Because I think they kind of get to the, to the philosophical core of the question. And yeah, if we take serious about egalitarianism, I think, I don't know, I think that's just a very serious objection. Answer to that in, in defense of, of Ingrid's approach. Um, I mean, one, well, two very quick answers. One is, well, if we're all, always going to compare one another, then, then it doesn't matter, right? Then if it's not wealth, it will be something else. So you satisfy human nature. That's kind of a silly, a silly answer to what I think is a silly argument. The serious answer is wealth is special. Mm. It's right of Ingrid to focus on wealth because we talk about economic resources here. I mean, you might be saying that in other societies, in a supposedly libertarian society, actual, actually economic resources would in the end be distributed very unequally. But then it's not libertarian, I think, in, in Ingrid's sense. Uh, wealth and, and income, economic resources are special because they allow you to do so many things, right. especially against others. So, so it makes a difference whether the limit is on wealth or other things. Okay. Thank you.
So Ingrid, I'm going to limit you to one minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or I'm going to try. That's okay. So Leah, I just want to say in response to your argument, um, in my country, people who, there's zero point, I mean roughly, I, I don't know exactly, but I think 0.1% of the population above the 10 million wealth line. That means that for 99.90% of the population, they can still do the competitive stuff with, uh, if you have a cap. So I, I don't think it's either or. So I just think by limiting, you would, we would take away some of that uh, comparative element. On the question about growth and, and uh, international, um, international system, I have, uh, the 10th chapter really says, okay, I only argue about limiting wealth and reducing wealth concentration, but this is one, what I believe is a derata of a fair socioeconomic system. I do not have an answer to what the complete fair socioeconomic system would be, but it's a, I think it is the most important question we have today. Uh, well, that's at least what I think. And degrowth is a possibility, but we have a range of proposals, and I think these are the ones we should study, but that fair socioeconomic system should also entail a fairer international economic architecture. So that is clear, and then we should, uh, uh, when we have global uh, production, we should pay those who produce our goods uh, much more, and also, yes, think about um, fairness internationally in many dimensions. That seems an excellent place to wrap up this evening's discussion. Thank you once again to the panel here. Uh, thank you to Ingrid for writing the book and for coming here to uh, explain the key arguments to us. Thank you all for your questions. Sorry I didn't get to everybody, but please do join us to uh, buy a book. Uh, have Ingrid sign your copy. Um, uh, only pre-publication copies, in fact, not officially, I think, launched until tomorrow. Um, and join us for a, for a glass of wine and a bite to eat. But please join me in thanking you.